Why did you start working with startups? How did you end up venturing into this space? I love the journey. I love the trials. I love the challenges of what entrepreneurs go through. To be able to decide one day that, hey, there's a problem that I want to solve and there's a group of people that I think will be interested in doing that. And there's no existing path to pursue it. Being able to pay that for yourself. I mean, imagine the, the sacrifice you have to make to be able to go through that. And it was just something that always interested me. And so when I graduated from University of Houston, I think people come to me saying, I want to nap out in a month. Okay, to do what? They're like, I'm going to get a thousand users in four months. Okay, you still don't know the core problem you want to solve. How do you expect me to build it for you? How do you expect you to go get customers? Yeah. And if you're going to build something for them and then they realize they want something else. And then they blame the agency because, yeah. hey, you built the wrong thing. After that, my life changed. And I realized without that experience, I would have kept working and, you know. Be a cog in a wheel. Be a cog in a wheel and, and, wheel and yeah. you know, to extreme, maybe sh** myself. I don't know. It's, it, it was that bad. It's like all I could talk about work. This is how bad it was. It was so bad that like four or five years ago, my friend said, I'm coming to Austin. You know, me and my friends are getting a boat. I like Travis. I'd invite you, but if you bring up the business model canvas, you're getting kicked out. Also three years ago, there was a room, myself, and then there's 20 or so community leaders from all the chambers, you know, Capital Factory, and a, a bunch of people. And the question to everyone was. Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on YJ. He graduated from the University of Houston, yeah. was involved with various communities around Austin. Ascend Austin is one of them. Executive Council Network, I think you're a founding member there as well. On your LinkedIn, you say you're chief fund officer of York's Game Pieces. Yeah. So we'll talk a lot about that as well. And then your professional career, you work at Dell. Currently, you're the senior program manager at Dell for Startups, where you, I think, Dell supports and has a lot of programs for startups. And then you, a couple nights ago, we went to one of the largest um, AAPI events, which I think got in tenants of over two to 300 people, I think largest that I've seen so far, but very involved with the startup community in Austin. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Something I wanted to start with is asking... Why did you start working with startups? Is there something that excites you about working with startups? How did you end up venturing into the space? I think it was always interesting. I mean, if I was talk about how I got involved, I think it would probably start when, as a kid, I was the type of person who just loved everything, who loved learning about everything. And it may have stemmed from potentially even an insecurity in a sense that I saw people who were really passionate about magnets or were really passionate about, you know, I love swimming. I love learning about the different forms and backstroke's my favorite, even though for me it gets water in my nose. Um, it was just really intrigued about why people were so sure about themselves. And certainly there's a lot of people who aren't, but like had very interesting hobbies and it always made me think about why you chose certain things. And why does that relate to startups is because like, as I kind of go looked into my educational career, I struggle with figuring out what that one major I want to, as a lot of people probably had. And I remember talking to my advisors, like, can I just triple major in all these like different business majors? And they're like, well, you know, just there's this entrepreneurship degree that you can apply for. So I, Got involved with our entrepreneurship program at the University of Houston and was part of the, got selected to be one of the 40 students for the Wolf Center on Entrepreneurship. And it was a phenomenal experience. We were given patents from the university to look to commercialize. Nice. Got to meet Warren Buffett because of it too and, and had a really interesting conversation with him at the uh, visit of Nebraska Furniture Mart and then, you know, the Omaha Steakhouse and really talked to him about like how he was like as a kid and even now. And I think that was something of realizing that I love the journey. I love the trials. I love the challenges of what entrepreneurs need, you know, go through, like to be able to decide one day that, Hey, there's a problem that I want to solve. And there's a group of people that I think will be interested in doing that. And there's no existing path to pursue it, being able to pay that for yourself. I mean, imagine the, the sacrifice you have to make to be able to go through that. And it was just something that always interested me. And so when I graduated from University of Houston, I think trying to, you know, continue to see what that looks like for myself, 
was always something that was was you know I was interested in and even now like one of my favorite things about working with startups is just getting to know their stories it's like yeah. why this startup you know why this podcast why did you decide to do the things that you're in, you're, you're doing now or you know why are you so weird and it's like just like conversations like yeah. what what made people interested in doing the things that they're doing makes sense and so it'd be safe to say you're working very closely with startups in various capacities right whether it's the communities in austin or via dell have you ever thought about starting your own company and i would say york's game pieces is your own company but outside of that like a proper SaaS tech company has that ever come in come into mind or play or is it on the back burner for now that was actually something i struggled a lot with between loving entrepreneurship but for some reason didn't care much about being one and the whole thing with the york's game pieces york is my little brother's name okay so in fact like he started in and you know being able to help him with this journey was was really something interesting and in, in learning about how to work with family nice. how do you resolve these conflicts i think that was one of the the best experiences i think me as a family i had to remind myself that you know working on business together doesn't mean quality time with your family too yeah 100 you know? percent. so so I, I also had to learn that really early on. But all that being said is that, like, with York Scan Pieces, I have seven 3D printers. We sell a lot on Etsy, Amazon, and a few other sites. If one day we stop getting sales, I'm not going to lose sleep on it. I think I realized, and it took a while to get here, was that I love learning about stories. I love collaborating. I love working with founders. I love being that person that can help daydream with you and figure out, you know, how can we make this better, what the future looks like. But I realized that I would love to be that coach or supporter. Makes sense. I think I have absolutely no interest in, in doing anything myself. I have no interest in necessarily even building my own business unless like I've reached out to everyone and there's this problem that no one else is solving. And even then, you know, my goal would be like, let's let's help solve this problem. And then who else cares just as much to take it over and, and fix it? Makes sense. I like that. Do you ever worry about not being able to help or relate with an entrepreneur because you've never been on the other side? Or do you feel like you understand enough about the journey to be able to support? And the reason I ask yeah. is there's always that notion of like when you talk about VCs, right? Yeah. People will be like, hey, you're just an MBA grad who's signing checks. Yeah. What do you know about building a company, right? Do you ever worry about that? Or do you feel like you understand enough of both sides to provide? I understand enough of what I know and what I actually don't know. So Makes when sense. I do come up with questions, like I also make it very transparently and clear to everyone. Guys, if you're asking me how to make money, we're both gonna go broke. Like I've never been in a position where I've had to ask for funding or to ask for investment. I've had started companies. I've started company with friends. I've started marketing companies, agencies. I've learned how to hack into my neighbor's routers when I was a kid. So learning, you know, HTML back yeah. then and uh, learning, you know, how do you code based on the videos on YouTube and, and Google. And now that we have like a lot of these AI platforms, I can literally spit out the code. So am I the type of person who can look into code and figure out you know how do we modify things um have that experience and, and acumen talent though am i the developer no that's not my role it's not my strength am i the person who is really good about asking for funny investment no also not my talent my strength now i can work together figure out how can we tell the emotional story so yeah. that we can be friends with these investors um but potentially you know when it comes to like hey have you exited a company now and in fact I realized really um, relatively early is that, that my role in life and in this in this world is to be a collaborative visionary that enables discovery for communities to see what's possible. And I share that with my family, my work, with my community, saying and telling people that the conversation, decisions, and encompass that dictates and directs the relationships I build, the conversations I have, it's always about enabling discovery. And what I mean by that is that if you're trying to build a community, if you're trying to uh, understand how to build something sustainably, and, and that could be for your family, for your church, or whatever religious affiliation, or for your work, how do we share with people that we can build communities in a way that's sustainable? I'm tired of social workers going homeless. I'm tired of you know, 
potentially organizations that see community efforts as cost centers and not necessarily things that could potentially drive product insight or yeah. you know sales or marketing. Hundred percent. And so I make it very clear and transparent. It's like this is what I talk about, um, and this is the only thing I care about, and this is how I can support you. And everything else, we have a lot of makes friends. Sense. Makes sense. No, I, I like that. I also strongly believe in understanding your lane, understanding where your skill sets are. Similarly, if I'm talking to someone, I can, I can talk a lot about how to fundraise, but I'm going to caveat that by saying I have never done this. So this is my opinion. This is what yeah. I think works based on conversations, based on people I've had on, but very corely understanding, hey, this is my lane. Here's how I can. But tell me how it went, right? You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, you know, yeah. I'll just share this with you, but let me know how it goes. You know, the, was was all my advice, like complete shit. Like, yeah. You know. And a hundred percent. And I think also early stage founders get the wrong information no. from social media because there's so much content overload. It's very hard to know right from wrong. Yeah. Part of the reason I started this was I feel like entrepreneurship is a five to ten year journey at the minimum, if not longer. I think the average successful age of an exited founder is 46 or 48 or something in the, yeah. in the, uh, on the higher 30, higher 40 side. People, I, I run a software services company and people come to me saying, I want to nap out in a month. I'm like, okay, to do what? They're like, I'm going to get a yeah. thousand users in four months. But I'm like, okay, who, what's the problem? You still don't know the core problem you want to solve. How do you expect me to build it for you? How do you expect you to go get customers? And the notion that, hey, everything's like, just gonna happen and fall and i feel like that's the wrong they, story they didn't to even have set that time to like reflect yeah. themselves yeah. and if you're gonna build something for them and then they realize they want something else and you're, you're just wasting yeah and then they time. blame the agency because yeah. hey you built the wrong product right and that's part of the reason is i want to talk about hey it's a long it's yeah. a grind right like don't do this for the money don't do this for the payday the likelihood of you getting a payday is very low um so do it for every, all the other reasons. Like you said, you enjoy the problem solving, the solution yeah. and everything. Cool. How important would you say community is to the journey of an entrepreneur or a startup? And even before then, what do you consider community? How would you define community? I mean, great question. Cause like all of us, we're always part of different communities and it means different things to different people all i want to share with people is the way that i picture community is and this is something i've shared with people before is like imagine like you know your wife and your best friend or uh two of your best friends from from different industries or or two of your your favorite co-workers imagine if they themselves had a great relationship with each other too what would that do for you it would be a very good ecosystem of just yeah if your wife and best friend was really good friends maybe they'll surprise you yeah like during the anniversary or during your birthday yeah you know what would it mean to know that the two people that you care about the most in the world also cared about each other and what would that do for that relationship with you and when you start building and expanding on that you realize that even certain communities we're not great at everything not com one single community is good at everything what does it mean when we bring multiple communities together and collaborate? There are certain things that they, they're really good at on their own lane. And then what if we collaborated together? You know? And then now we're talking about how do we build strong ecosystems, yeah. right? And in biology, we learned that you know, developing and learning and understanding ecosystems is learning about how community of organisms interact with each other. Yeah. And so I think that's the beauty of a community. And even more than that, even at a core, if you looked at, and there's there's a TED talk on the longest Harvard study review. I don't know, have you seen it? No, I haven't. So it's a 75 year old study in Harvard that had over three directors. And what they did was they interviewed 200 men in the course of every two years, interview them, and they followed them through their life. And half of them were from Harvard, half of them were just, you know, some boys on the street and, and from other public schools. And they realized the people that lived the longest, healthiest lives were the people who had the biggest families and closest relationship ties. In fact, some of the folks from, from Harvard actually died really early. Um, and so what we learned from that is that, you know, to live a healthier and happier life, 
is how do we make sure that we build strong communities? Is it saying that, oh, well, what about the sacrifice I'm doing with a startup? Well, there's also a community of entrepreneurs that also understand that journey yeah. and can make it really easy for you. You don't have to do it alone. In fact, solo founders probably pissed me off the most. I was like, you know, talking to this solo founder who spent 10 years working on, 10 years in, in startups and tech, especially was like, you know, this, if you hadn't made any moves by now, I don't know when you will ever be. But even then I, I would ask them a single question. It's like, do you think your competitors are doing this by themselves? Yeah. Okay, then why are you? What, what would you say is the importance of finding the right community? Because like you said, there's a lot of communities, there's a lot of places to go. You also talked about ecosystems. What would you say is, two questions, What what is the importance of finding the right community? How can that affect a startup or founder's perspective? I think you covered, touched on that a little bit. And follow up to that, what is there a difference between having a community and an ecosystem and when does a community become a thriving ecosystem yeah i would say that the importance of finding the right community is as creatures who desire social acknowledgement awareness and you can you can think of it from like maslow's hierarchy of like self-actualization and I don't know how you can actualize or understand yourself without people. Yeah, makes it's sense. It's because a lot of our identities is, is sometimes even based off how our community sees us. And you can see this as a kid, you know, when you, and especially your story about you traveling to, to different, you've probably had a chance to try out different versions of yourself with each community. Yeah, 100%. And, and you probably know this more than a lot of people, and I learned this too late. But it's fascinating that when you go back to older communities, they couldn't push you back into a box of how they perceived you. And so when you're ever trying to grow yourself, it's really hard to grow because sometimes the community, the on the community, may see a version of you and feel comfortable with that version and may want to keep you there. Yeah. And so I share that because that can literally make or break your life by surrounding yourself with who you know by putting yourself with the right community and and there's you know all these verbiages and adages that talk about well you know you're going to be the sixth of your first five friends right yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. If, if your first like five the average of your yeah. yeah yeah and so i think that's important now the difference between eco ecosystem and community um you know when when we look at different communities like even in austin all the different startup communities and you have the chambers, you have, you know, the accelerators, you have the early stage and, you know, everyone, all these community leaders have, you know, a group of hundred startups and a hundred, a hundred, you know, mentors. And, and it's great because they all have specific skills or stages that they're catering to. Now, when I talk about ecosystem, when I talk about like, how do we build a thriving ecosystem, this is no longer just a single community. An ecosystem is how are these different accelerators, you know, universities, you know, corporations and media companies, the government, how are they all working together specifically for startups? So when we think about how strong is our startup ecosystem, I think about, well, how strong are the universities with collaborating with the corporations and the, the early stage accelerators and the community leaders that are just hosting events, um, you know, on a monthly basis. And then, you know, how are we supporting the women, you know, entrepreneurs and, and how, how's the ecosystem for women entrepreneurs? And when I think of the ecosystem for women entrepreneurs, I think of, well, you know, how are we supporting women leaders and universities and communities? And so one of the things is that when you see cities who are very siloed, there is no ecosystem. There's communities and there are cities that have strong communities, but an ecosystem is when they start collaborating with each other. I like, it. I like that definition. Would you say Austin's ecosystem is growing, is yet to grow? Do you have any thoughts on that? And I know a lot of people have no. contrarian opinions on this, but would love your take on where you think Austin lies in that. My personal take, just to give you, uh, I feel like Austin's super early. I feel like there's a lot of momentum that Austin can use, but I also at the same time feel like it's not, at, and I'm talking purely from a startup perspective, I feel like it, it doesn't thrive as much as SF or New York because you need someone on each stage of the journey to be part of that ecosystem yeah. 
for the ecosystem to thrive. I feel like Austin's heavily weighted towards people earlier in their journey. There's not as many people who have exited, been there, been successful, who are coming back and in, in the ecosystem like, oh, hey, let me help you do X, Y, Z. That's my personal take. And the funny thing to- is, is that that's like everyone else in Texas is like, oh, we should go to Austin. And and then they learn about those things. And in a sense, I've also had the the privilege to see how other ecosystems, you know, Atlanta, Detroit, Chicago, and, and see how they build. And certainly, you know, no one thinks about the Atlanta survey ecosystem. And I can tell you Atlanta survey ecosystem is phenomenal. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from different cities. And all that to say is that you're right. I think Austin, there's been indicators the past actually year and two years where it shows that we've made a lot of changes on, on how we are collaborating with each other. So I am really excited to say that, like, I think um, for the past six years, the last two were, were the last two, the last two years and most recent years were two years when I felt like we had made more changes than the first four that I've been here. And a lot of that has to do with there's certain communities that are starting to build up and the leaders of those communities have a strong desire to collaborate with each other. What? So I, I agree with that. I, and I think it's sort of in the middle of like, it could become really good, yeah. right? But at the same time, it could also just crash and burn in terms of just not the right things happening, right people. I would say the only only thing I have a not not against but what i see could be a potential um downside to this growing ecosystem is when you're fostering super early stage companies you need support for them you need early stage funds you need people who are gonna write pre-seed checks or angel checks and not want traction and not want revenue and friends i know who have been raising who are relatively early stage are getting that response of like, oh, come back when you have 20K MRR, right? But they're raising a pre-seed or angel round to go and prove out their validated idea. So like when they're at 20K MRR, they don't need to come back. They're going to go raise their series A or whatever, right? I feel like when that changes, if that changes, I think it will foster a lot more. I know folks who have moved from Austin to SF to raise a pre-seed round because they'll get lesser friction yeah from an sf investor than yeah. an austin investor we're a little but, bit more conservative yeah for sure yeah and I, I think that's fine i'm not saying that's wrong yeah. i feel like depending on the ecosystem that needs to be built that might need to sway one side or the other right 100%. because it's going to then dissuade super early stage from trying to come here build their relationships and yeah cool how do you find community how do you so you're part you well, as a part of Dell for startups you've gone to a lot of cities you've been a part of a lot of things do you have recommendations on how early stage founders can go and find community and if you want to segment to Austin we can do that yeah. as well but how should someone go and find community because i feel like it's easy to find community it's hard to find the right community for whatever i'm doing trying to do yeah. building whatever i think it's the same thing as how do i find the right agency yeah right be very clear what you're looking for right and be very intentional on what are the relationships that that you want to cultivate and then in addition to what are relationships that you want to cultivate what do you need to embody to be able to have those relationships and so when i think of like how is it easy to find community for me at my stage of my life it's because i'm very clear what i want i tell people like all i care about is collaborating with visionaries to enable discovery and I'm here to try to help community leaders to figure out, you know, how can we be more intentional in our engagement? And just that statement alone, it's really easy for me to to go to these different organizing associations and say, like, this is my role, these are my gifts, and this is how I want to contribute. And why do I want to contribute? Because at the end of my life, all I care about is supporting underserved, you know, communities with resources. And this is something that I'm I'm taking to my grave, knowing in full well that every day of my journey, I move towards towards that. And if I'm clear in that statement, am I clear with what my wants and, and why I want it? I realize that there's a lot of people that will love to support, not because of who I am, but because of my purpose and yeah. what I'm trying to do. And so I share with people, it's like, if you're struggling with trying to find community, 
it might be because you hadn't spent enough time introspecting with yourself of what do you want what do you want how long did it take you to figure that out come up with that mission statement and find that that's a long story that's another like two three hours but the short of it was tactically it was may end of may may 28th of 2021 so it's almost three years okay three years now and I had a mentor who invited me to Arizona because long story short, I was going through like this huge midlife crisis where I was like, YJ, you're, you're working at Dell in a corporate setting, supporting startups. You've been doing this for, for two, three years now. Why are you not happy? Makes sense. I was like, you don't, you don't care much about starting your own business and you were able to find a corporate job supporting startups. Like not a lot of people have that type of opportunity. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Right, and it's it's great now because I have like the friends in, at Intel and, and Nvidia who are all part of the startup, and I can tell you that like it's it's a small community of people in corporate supporting startups. And I was asking myself, you got to learn, you got to talk with with all these entrepreneurs and get to support corporate. Why are you not happy? And I realized I spent so much of my identity at work. Um, in business and startups, I didn't know how to relate to people. I didn't know how to resolve family issues. I didn't know what community. I didn't have faith. Um, I spent a lot of my years um, as an atheist until I figured out my relationship with the universe and with God. And I remember one time it was because I had a friend who passed away. Because, and this was a friend that recruited to Dell who. You know, his first month was like, why do you love my job, love my manager, come be my girlfriend. I was like, man, I've been here for like two, three years. You're dating someone already. You love your job. You're so happy. And like, stop fucking working, YJ. Like, come hang out at the pool with, with, with my girlfriend. And then he passed away one day. And his last conversation with him was, was him telling me that he was on a call with my little sister and helping her with a breakup. I was like, man, how's my little sister doing? I don't remember the last time I talked to her. And so... That really made me very self-aware. It's like, I, I don't really have direction. Like, I think for all intents and purposes, I should be content. But why why do I I'm not, not feel happy? Yeah. And I think a lot of people feel that way. You know, it's like, look, I'm working towards this. And, and then one day they have a midlife crisis and say, like, I don't know what any of this is for. And this guy one day who worked at Intel at the time, asked me how I was doing and I just started crying and I was like I, I don't know and he was like why do you why don't you come to to Arizona and let me help you out and he did this thing called a life plan which is created by this uh Peter Drucker and Tom Patterson and and after two days I realized after the first day I realized what I want to do for the rest of my life and I knew it was a purpose because it was something that applied to my family my work my spirituality one community and then myself and the second day was how does that actually get realized? What are the tactical things to be able to live it? And um, learning what did I need to surrender of myself to make sure I live life with purpose. That week, talked to my manager and said, this is all I care about. This is what's gonna keep me at Dell. Talked to my family and said like, hey, this is how we should be better at working together. And um, a year ago, we had a whole family meeting and we evaluated everyone's like, uh, you know, I'm also a licensed strengths coach and we had everyone's um, strengths finders, the top 34, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's an assessment that identifies, there's 34 talents, what are your top 10? And how do we focus on our strengths? And, and community is about how do we leverage each other's gifts to support yeah. each other. And my family had everyone's assessment and realized, man, it's not that we didn't try, it's that we struggle with certain things. My family stopped arguing ever since then. Me and my siblings have been weekly meeting talking about love, life, and business ever since then and going to figuring out what faith means for me and then you know serving at my church and then you know learning about you know other people's faith journeys and figuring out how do we how do we support people who believed in similar things right and then also understanding like what this community mean you know how are we working with students and everything after the two and a half years but what happened in that one day was introspection with my whole life leading up to it all the turning points in my life and realizing that nothing was necessarily random 
like all the times that your life has changed and with your perspective of life change um, and how that impacted you personally, vocationally, you know, spiritually, community, whatever that looked like. Like if you were to spend time and I truly don't think you can do this alone because you need people to call you out. It's like, hey, 100%. Like, I think what you just said is a bias of, of how you're trying 100%. to frame yourself. Like stop telling yourself, that, like reframe it, rethink it. And realizing that if you look at your inflection point, like there's certain, there's common themes and you may, and people who don't spend time reflecting on that, they might not even notice it. I remember I was in like seven different student orgs, you know, in college. I was working part-time and I was volunteering at my high school. I had the most amount of volunteering hours, um, but I was like the dumbest kid, right? And, you know, I, I remember just doing random things and have random hobbies. Like my first hobby was photography. And then I played drums and then I did, you know, swimming and, and all these other things. But then being able to sit and reflect is like, why is it that I did those things? What were some of those things that really changed my life? And you realize that they were all leading towards something. And mm -hmm. this is what it was leading to. Being a collaborative visionary that enables discovery for community to see what is possible. I like it. What's the what's the thing you did out in Arizona? What did you So refer? my my mentor and and my best friend and and I can even call like someone who saved my life. He did this assessment called the Life Plan, which life plan. was a two day session um, to help people find his purpose. And he was willing to do it for me, um, you know, for free. He was like, "Why did it's ten thousand dollars?" I was like, I, "I can't afford that." But he was like, "I, I want to. I feel called to to help you with it." And I'm forever grateful for him and everything that that he does and, and how he continues to pour into me and after that my life changed and i realized without that experience i would have kept working and you know just not saying the kid be a cog one, in a wheel sort of cog in a wheel and yeah. and you know to extreme maybe shoot myself i don't know it's it, it was that bad and it's like all i could talk about work this is how bad it was are you familiar with the business model canvas like no, the, the no. one so there's a one pager business model canvas really good with ideation yeah like, yeah, yeah. I, I i understand what you're saying so yeah, yeah i would i would print 20 pages of these templates out so anytime someone came this was three years ago every time someone came over it's like hey have you have like my first two questions is you what do you do for fun and how do we make money off of it how do we commercialize it how do we start a business off of it it was so bad that like four or five years ago my friend said i'm coming to austin I'm, you know, me and my friends are getting a boat at Lake Travis. I'd invite you, but if you bring up the business model canvas, you're getting kicked out. But I didn't even say anything. And then, like, I had a roommate one time ask me for dating advice. I was like, first off, I don't know why you're asking me. And I pull out the business model canvas and I caught the word business and put dating. I was like, what's your value prop? What's your customer segment? What channels are you reaching? You know, are you Tinder? You're you know, just whatever. so ingrained. I was that. so ingrained. I was like, was this helpful? And it's like, I hate you so much, YJ. I was like, I didn't know how to talk about anything yeah. else. Cause that's basically what you're living and breathing that's yeah. just everything that you and then i realized why it's because if all the changes in your life the things that literally shift your perspective was always in business and personal then of course you never knew you never had the, the inflection points that allowed you to transform your family your faith your community 100 percent. i love the level of clarity you have um i think that's something i'm trying to figure out over the next couple of months myself but i think having clarity and sort of mission vision how do you get there is the earlier the better but i also feel like you have to go through some repetitions and like bad analogy but like fall off the cycle a couple of yeah. times until you figure it out right it's not you're not going to do right out of college you're not going to you know have a banger idea you had like, to hey, this is the purpose right yeah um but no, I love the level of clarity that you have. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just like, hey, how do I figure all this shit out? But no, um, good thing that this could, this is coming out in a couple of weeks, so no one listening <laughs> can hold me to this. But um, going back to community, how do you personally leverage community? Let's not talk about founders, startups. How do you leverage it? What do you like about it? How do you build that ecosystem around you that helps you thrive and grow? Yeah. I think to answer that question is 
fulfillment for me is seeing when people realize how much that they can do together when mm-hmm. they start collaborating. And to tell you my favorite moments were when I'm working with people to, to host events and then during the event, I would hear, you know, some two community leaders like, hey, you know, one of them says, like, hey, you know, did you, did you get that email that I sent you? You know, we're thinking about like hosting an event and I'd love to work with you. And, and they would respond back. It's like, no, I hadn't had a chance to, to look at it, but you know, we, we definitely love to support. And, and this is, and you just realize that it just starts with being in the room together. Yeah, 100%. And that, that's what really drives me because at the end of the day, I know that if these two people are meeting, like the hundred of people, like both of them are influencing and, and not even, not even caring about the startups or, or potential yeah. businesses, but what about their families? Yeah. Like what would it mean for their two families to come together and to realize like, Hey, this is how we can support each other. And so at the end of the day, like for me, it's, it's always truthfully taking myself out of it and figuring out how we can help people build relationships with each other. And, and that's what for me, community building is. Do you have a moment from the past couple of years that stands out as, hey, that was like one pivotal thing that you were able to help. No, I don't, I don't want to use the word influence, but like, no. you were involved somehow of like putting two and two together, and something great happened out of it. Did something stick with you over the past couple of years, or are there just too many of those? I things? mean, at this point, there's a lot of them, but I, I remember a lot of them vividly. Just you know, realizing my purpose. One of them was. We hosted an event in, in Vegas, you know, for Dell, um, and we had this whole, you know, pitch tour where Dell was visiting different cities and, and tactically was trying to bring all the community leaders together. And also knew that, you know, if we if we brought it together, what it means is that certain communities that they serve may learn about other resources that also exist in that city. And I remember hosting like this pitch showcase in the city of Vegas, and then. You know, being able to follow a few months later, hearing from uh, the University of Las Vegas the Ergonomic Development Center, I was like, "Hey, we started hosting pitch competitions. Now that we know, you know, how to do them and run them, right. how easy it was, it's like we started doing this." And then uh, hearing, you know, other cities started. You know, one of the panels that we did is this: the state of the startup ecosystem in multiple cities. Hearing that people were also hosting and and organizing these panels, and then also three years ago, I believe it was three years ago, was. I remember there was a room, uh, you know, at the Round Rock Chamber myself, and then there's 20 or so community leaders uh, from all the chambers, you know, Capital Factory, and um, there was, uh, you know, Cherie from Fiesta. There's a, a bunch of people, you know, Mark Nathan was there as well, like all in that one room. And the question to everyone was, what are challenges? Why are we not working together? You know, what are the things that, that we could be struggling? It was the first time a lot of these community leaders you know, even though we see each other at our own events, like was intentionally in this room together to talk about what can we be doing to to help Austin out. And I remember someone coming out to me and was like, YG, we, we, we tried doing this 10 years ago, but like, it's it's just it's just falling apart. I was like, I'm glad it's being brought back again. I hope, you know, it continues. And, you know, if anything, you know, whether or not it continues today, it was like having that meaning to share like, hey, we, we're all here. Like we we all live here. Austin's such a small city geographically. Like guys, it doesn't take long to see each other. It does. It's not that hard to meet, and to talk about here are the shared challenges, opportunities, and then stemming from that conversation, someone started hosting a get together for Austin women entrepreneurs led by Leslie Robinson, right? And so slowly there's these these uh, seeds that get planted, these meetings that get planted just because we're, we're putting people in the same room. And so I mean, there's multiple examples of that in all across the US that we support. Nice, I like that. I feel like, I, I think Mark mentioned this. I had him on um, early in one of the first five episodes and he talks about how one of the issues that Austin has is, one is discoverability, right? I've been going to events every day for the past year and a half or two. So I have a system to find events. I still don't find all of them, but there's stuff I can find more than the average. Mark was talking about how someone tried to make like a 
Austin Tech calendar, but the place that it falls or like falls short is people start getting political about, okay, who decides what goes on that central calendar? Who's the deciding org, right? Who decides whether a startup thing goes on a tech yeah. thing or like an e-com thing goes? And that's where it starts falling short. So I know a bunch of people who are trying to make like calendars, but I feel like discoverability of such events to then go find the community is also a partial challenge. It's not like a big yeah. challenge, but it's for someone new to Austin, everyone keeps asking me, hey, how do you find all these events? It's not rocket science. Like once you know where to look, there's probably only 20 or 30 like web pages to look it's at. It's really tough because the community leaders want to be very protective yeah yeah and for all the right reasons we want to make sure that we were creating shared values and we're we're making sure that we're we're protecting our our internal members from you know potentially bad actors but there's also this level of let's just trust that our members know exactly like what they look for they can weed themselves and and maybe there's a community that's actually better for them. Yeah. And if we want to talk about ecosystem at a community level, sure, you know, gatekeep all you want, right? You know, I, I see boundaries, healthy boundaries as a good thing, not necessarily to exclude people without, but to show like, this is how the right people can be part of my community. 100%. But if we're talking about it from a city level, like, hey, if we're trying to build ecosystem, there's no gatekeeping involved, you know? Naturally, with a city as small as Austin geographically, people will know who the good people are. Yeah, people talk. It's it's such a small community. We know who the good actors, the bad actors, people with good intentions, people with bad intentions. We also know when people start growing, changing. Right? And it's like, hey, this person might have not been that great, but I see over time that they've been softening up and being like a lot more yeah. supportive, and yeah. and we give people grace. And so when it comes to sharing, it's like, look. If this is a community calendar, great. But if you're trying to say that you're supporting the ecosystem, that's not the way to do it. Because you're right. There's a lot of people that are very political about it and you know, for all the good intentions, but that doesn't help. 100%. And I feel like to your point, if someone's a bad actor, they'll show up to maybe one event, two event. But in like the grand scheme of things, I would rather let 50 more people fine and come to my event every yeah. time even though there's high churn but i want to then find those one or two or three people who add value who need help who need support yeah. and um but like it's one of those like discoverability problems of it's going to take a lot longer if you do two at a time versus if you do like 50 60 at a time maybe it could also be a scarcity thing it's like what if abanal leaves my community it's like, well, if he leaves, then it's probably because he found some place that he'd rather be yeah, in. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Like, you rather have people, like, who explore your world and decide to come back to you. Yeah. Like, those are people I'd rather be with. Yeah. Right? People who, out of all the options that they knew existed, they still decide to hang out with yeah. me. 100%. I'm a part of a lot of Slack groups, a lot of Slack communities. I'm barely active in any of them. But at any given point in time there's one thing top of mind for me and i will go to the community that supports that yeah right and because all these communities are focused on certain parts of life right but 100 percent agree that there's times when someone graduates they move on if there's a community for builders at some point you've built executed and you're not a builder anymore it doesn't yeah. make sense for you to be part of a community of builders yeah. if you know you're relaxing in life yeah. right now but 100 percent agree do you have any recommendations for local Austinites, early stage folks? Where can they start? Um, do you have anything off the top of your head where you're like, hey, check out these one or two or three places, communities, resources? I think there's a lot. I think the, the Austin Stars Facebook group is one. I think Sherry does a really yeah. great job yes, with her yeah. Fiesta events. I think... Um, a lot of chambers, they may be able to scope, but they're also kept in loop with all the things that are happening in the city. And I didn't even know there were so many chambers. Oh, I knew there was a lot yeah. of chambers. I didn't know there were so many until I came to the event the other day. I was like, okay, interesting. I didn't know there was an Indian chamber. I was like, oh, there's. We have a lot of minority chambers. And my favorite part is that 
there's this organization called DECA, which is consisted of the LGBT, the Hispanic, the Black, the the Asian, um, I feel like the Latino uh, chambers, and they all meet regularly to talk about how they can support each other too. And so there's there's a lot of different communities and groups, and even in a, in the Star Wars world. But you know, if if you're new to Austin, probably the first one is just engage with some of these Slack channels. Um, the Austin Startups Facebook group is a great community, um, and then Fiesta is also a great community to to start and see which direction you want to go. And yeah. like my advice is be clear. Even if you don't know what you want, tell people like, hey, I really don't know what I'm doing right here or i really don't know what direction but i'm trying to figure that out and if you even just and at least that you're clear on i think austin people are a lot more supportive yeah. i feel like if in any austin community you're like i'm winging it i'm trying to figure shit out more people be like oh can i help you with xyz versus you don't get that vibe in sf or new york as much because yeah. they're more like hit the ground running kind of places austin's more like you know, I could use some help in X, Y, Z, and be yeah. like, oh, yeah, why don't I help you? I'll, I'll, I'll you know, um, I'll spend a couple hours, get you off the ground. Um, but I feel like that's a very Austin thing. Yeah, very Texas thing, too. Yeah. I like ending a lot of my episodes with a couple questions I have for folks. Sure. One thing I wanted to ask you was, what, what would you say is your support system? I think you've covered part of it throughout, but... What would you say is your support system that allows you to stay driven, motivated, be on your mission? My partner, for sure. Uh, she's very... She's the type of person... Not anything with, with startups. Um, she's the type of person that, that's really good about grounding me. Okay. Um, family, certainly. My mentor, who is still... Continues to check in on me every single week. Who I constantly just... I'm amazed that he's willing to spend and invest in time and it feels weird. I was like, I'm not deserving of this. And for him, it's like, I'm just doing my purpose. It's like my purpose right now is calling me to support you. And and I shared with them, like there's, there's no way I can pay him back. The only way that I can pay him back is to really just pay it forward and in the best way that I know how. And I think just realizing that these affirmations like when people come up to me, it's like why did you like this this means a lot it's like even if and i can probably share this with you know all the community leaders probably feel the same way like sure sometimes we're, we're hosting events we're running around you know trying to meet people trying to get people included but if you spend time and just like go up to them and say like hey this is what you did for me whether or not you were intentional about it that's so helpful and that's so uh, affirming that that gives us uh, the encouragement to continue to to keep going because it is all at work i don't think anyone you know one day decided like hey you know i want to have all the challenges and and problems that comes and all the drama and politics that come with running an event that has 900 people on there yeah. and 12 community leaders it's like it's a lot of work and if you take it personally you're you're gonna lose white hair i mean you know it's similar to like who runs the biggest community in the u.s is you know our president and you know they you you look at those four-year transitions and they're like wow it looks like you aged like 20 years and and similarly every single community leader i mean when they do it it's, it's very personal for them so for for the community leaders to, for the community members to to share with them like hey this is what it did for me Hundred percent. Not that really supports and drives us. Nice. I like that. What are three resource recommendations you have for folks early in their journey, or folks looking for community, or folks local to Austin? Pick whatever you want. Just three resources that can be groups, books, communities, blogs, pocket, whatever. There's one thing to take away from this is you hear it in my conversation, you hear it and and the value that communities bring, but finding the right people in your life. Yeah. And I've shared this where I call it the four P's of mentoring. There's four types of mentor relationships that you should have. One's a professional mentor. So any one that's doing something that you see yourself potentially interested in every single title, job, or industry, find a professional mentor. 
It's people with 10, 20 years of experience. You know, it could be a startup founder, a serial entrepreneur, it could be an investor, you know, it could be, you know, a governor, you know, whatever it is. Professional mentor is someone who has experience in those fields and, and titles and, and roles. You also need a personal mentor, someone who shares with you that life isn't about work. Make sure you bring your mom flowers for Mother's Day. Make sure you check in with your dad. Make sure, you know, your siblings are okay. When's the last time you talked to your siblings? It's like, I, I don't know. It's like, well, you know, maybe we should fix that. So a personal mentor who kind of makes sure that you're living life holistically. Someone who even encourages you that, hey, when's the last time you worked out? That's what my mentor 100%. does for me. A peer. Someone who has maybe a few levels, few years of experience. Uh, not necessarily. It could be someone who, who's at the same organization, who's a senior. If you're a freshman, it's a senior. If you're in corporate, it could be someone in a different team who's been at that company a little bit longer. Someone who can help you navigate your current life stage. Someone who has relevant information about what you're going through right now. And then a protege. Someone that you're teaching. Why? Because like the advice that you're giving to them, they're going to apply it to something else and they'll come back to you and tell you if it's a good idea or not. It's like, hey, YJ, like the advice you gave me, it worked really well in this industry that I didn't even like know that existed. Yeah. Or YJ, that advice was a, was shit. Like, that didn't help. I was like, oh, well, did you do this? You know, and, and what we learned from that is affirming in, in our learnings and wisdom to, to check if, if our own wisdom is, is applicable in different areas, but also teaches us how to be better mentees. I like that. Never heard the four Ps before, but I like that. I've, I've talked about, um, I've talked with some friends that I've thought about setting up like an advisory board for yeah. myself, Yep. which is people whose opinions I trust, whose way of thinking I trust, slightly different facets, right? But yeah. like my thinking was, can I set this up and just have 30 minutes a month. I'll run you through what I'm doing, what I'm planning to do, what my plans are. And you either call bullshit or you tell me, yeah. hey, I would think about this another way. And then I go and I do my shit and then come back and like, this worked, this didn't work, blah, blah, blah. Gallup so, actually has a, a tool and I really like that because it's, it's called like the personal board of directors, right? It's yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, there's this assessment called uh, the builder profile and it talks about the 10 talents that you could have to build a business, but how do you focus on your top four? So my, my top four talents are, are knowledge, determination, disruption, and relationship. So the way that whenever I approach a business, I try to figure out, you know, what do I know, what do I not know? Like, who can I leverage? And if it's something that I'm really passionate about, I'm just gonna, you know, work really hard. And then there's also delegator, uh, selling independence. Um, there's, you know, uh, profitability and confidence, and there's a few other ones. And but what's really cool is that it also talks about like, out of the three types of builders, which one are you? There's a rainmaker, conductor, and expert. And it shares that you need to have these three types of people in your business to make sure that you can grow and scale in the next three to five years. It's not saying that, um, and as founder, you're probably doing all three at once, but you need someone who's very profitable oriented, someone who can focus on bringing harmony to the team and someone focuses. And they have like these uh, templates, so definitely encourage people to check it out. Um, there's a book called Born to Build that comes with a free assessment and has a lot of these templates. But it talks similarly like this. Who is your coach? Who is your mentor? Who is um, your role model? And it, it lists these different personas. And then I'll also ask you, how close are you with them? How much, what type of interaction you need from them? And um, how often are you meeting with them? And so it also even goes a little bit deeper, similar to what you're sharing. I was like, you know, if, if there's a mentor of your, or there's some, a role model of yours, but I'm not close with them right now. You know, maybe I can work on that. And then if you were too close with them, what type of relationship would you want to have with them? And, and that's also how you can be really intentional with people that you're trying to help, that, that you're looking for help in your life. Yeah, I'll check that out. I like it. Sweet. And I end every show with a last question. So I ask past guests to give me a question for a future guest, and then I'll ask yeah. you to give me one as well. So your question is, what is it that makes you fundamentally human? What is it that makes me fundamentally human? The fact that I have emotions when it comes to living my life 
and service of others that I have it in me to want to serve others, that I have it in me to cry, laugh, and enjoy the human experience. Um, I think that's what makes us human, that we strive for finding belonging, that we try to, to strive for, for finding our community and try to make our community better and, and see what it does for, for us and what it does for people and to enjoy and be grateful for all the experience that comes with it. I think that's what makes us human, the, the roller coasters and trials and tribulations, but all the things and joy that we get from making people happy. I like that. It felt like you had that prepared, but no, very, very well said. <laughs> uh, what's what's your question for a future guest? Well, then I have to ask about their community. It's like, what is your favorite community? And what is it about that community that keeps you coming back to it? Okay, sweet. Well, that's all I had. Thank you for coming on. Where can listeners find you? What do you want to plug? What what can we link in the description? Yeah, feel free to connect uh, on LinkedIn. Um, we're uh, a few friends of mine are, are actually looking to create a mastermind group. So if anyone that is in a position or interested in building a community, um, then we're we're creating really small groups of people, and we're actually piloting this. This is probably the first time I'm sharing this with anyone publicly. That we're trying to create a group to figure out how we can be more intentional about community engagement. Nice. And I break it down to science, um, but there's also art to it. So I want to share, there's a lot of art and science when it comes to community building. There's a lot of data and metrics that we can leverage to understand how to have the right conversations. We're not using it to replace conversations, but we also understand the importance of, of collecting information to make sure we're intentional about it. And so there's a lot of science when it comes to, to how we build intentional communities. So feel free to reach out about that. And, you know, just be available, I guess. There's, I, I make myself available, you know, in a lot of these events. So yeah. maybe we'll see each other at, at some of these events in Austin. Sweet. Cool. And I think this will come out in a couple of weeks. So if there's anything going on, then we'll yeah. link everything. But thank you for coming on. It was my pleasure. Thanks for asking great questions. Yeah.